This is one of my favorite times of the year. The other day, I was driving through Callaway County, and I came across a tobacco field. Now, when I look at tobacco fields, they don't necessarily bring back great positive memories for me. Just saying. Some of the hardest work I've ever done in my life was in the tobacco field, or as we call it, the tobacco patch. This time of year, when it's hot, people are cutting tobacco, spiking the tobacco, putting it on tobacco sticks, putting it on scaffold wagons. It just brought back tremendous memories to me. It's almost like you know, going home back to my childhood and and thankful for those days and the relationships and the people in my life, my uncles who employed me and, and my goodness to make $10 an hour in the tobacco patch, you know, 15, 20 years ago was tremendous money. I mean, it was really good money and and you earned every, every cent you got. Can I get an amen? You earned every cent you got. And, and for me to drive around the South this time of year, if I see a a barn that has smoke rolling out of it, that does not prompt me to call the fire department, okay? I know people from up north who come down and visit in the south, they see a tobacco barn where someone is, I'm seeing some interesting smiles out there right now. Some of you are going, that was me. I called 911 and thought the barn was burning down. Uh, firing, dark fired tobacco, even the smell. Can y'all even smell it now? I mean, to me, it just brings back lots of really cool, neat stuff, even though there were some really hard times and a lot of sweat and tears in the tobacco patch. I can remember we'd start early, and during those days, even today, you know, my uncles would, would try to fire, find guys who would want to work. And so they might hear about a crew of guys down in Paris. They might hear of a crew of guys over in Pablo or over in Lyon County. And it was not uncommon for my uncles to go out early in the morning and the guys wherever they might be because they heard that they were willing to work and bring those guys back to Coldwater and work in the tobacco patch all day long and cut tobacco maybe even that week. I can remember... At the end of the day, or say at the end of the week, on Friday, if you worked all week, everybody would line up, and my uncles would get out their checkbook out of their pocket, and everybody would line up. And, and they would have, on a piece of paper, the hours that everyone had worked that week. And of course, you know what's getting ready to happen. They're going to pay them. They're going to pay them. They're going to pay them in accordance to the hours that they worked. And everyone lined up, got their paycheck, and went, and some guys went out and had a big time on the weekend. Some of my friends were really wise, would save their money, try to save up some money to buy a truck or something, you know. But I'll never forget those images in my mind. There is a story that Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 20 that screams working in the tobacco patch to me. It's known as the parable of the laborers. It's one of my favorite stories or parables that Jesus shares in all of Scripture. And this actual story comes in response to a question of Peter. Because Peter was thinking about in the kingdom of God, what are we going to get? In the kingdom of God, what are we going to get? For some, they even imagine this as if they die, and when they die, they're in line with all the other saints who've passed, and they're waiting to receive their eternal quote-unquote, rewards. What are they going to get? What will payday look like in heaven? And Peter asked the question. He says, so what about us? 
What about us, like, who've been with you to Jesus from the beginning, and we have, like, sacrificed so much, and we've left family and friend and farm, and, and we've given up everything to follow you. What will the payday look like for us there? Or maybe even in this life, what will it look like? Like So the question this morning that I would throw out to you is, if there is such a payday someday in heaven, what will your, your payday look like? Over the years, people have imagined this, and there have been even many songs sung about this, in thinking about rewards in heaven, you know, maybe crowns and jewels that you'll receive in your crown. How many jewels will be in your crown? Oh, there's an old song that we used to sing. I like the old song. Neat, neat song. I'm not for sure it's absolutely theologically correct, but we've got a mansion over the what? A mansion over the hilltop. Will your mansion be as big as my mansion? What is a mansion anyway? Three stories, two stories. I've heard people say, you know what? When I get to heaven... I just hope to have a little shack over in the corner, but it's probably going to be in the shadow of such and such mansion because they've done all this stuff for the kingdom of God. Jewels and crowns, mansions over the hilltop. Is this really what Scripture teaches in regards to to the afterlife? Will there be some who get more than others? Is this a picture of life now? That you have more materialistically today because you have served more and you've honored God more in your life. For some, they would call that the prosperity gospel. There's also what is known as the poverty gospel. The poverty gospel says, the more you sacrifice here, the more you get there. If you live like a pauper, you give everything away that you have, and you live as a poor person. One day, if you live in poverty today, one day in heaven, you're going to have a whole lot of stuff. So, so it leads you to think that maybe people do what they do for God today because of what they think they're going to get someday. Is this really the teaching of Jesus in regards to what life is like in the kingdom of heaven? Kingdom of heaven is also used synonymously in Scripture for the kingdom of God. It seems to suggest that biblically speaking, when we think about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, that it's not just talking about the way things are done in heaven, but even the way things are done now when God has rule and reign over our lives. So it's a teaching not just then and there, but it's a teaching also for here and now. So Peter comes to Jesus and he says, okay, we have sacrificed so much. Actually, you can find this question of Peter in Matthew chapter 19 when he says to Jesus, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for who? What then will there be for what then will there be for us? What then? Will there be there for you? So Jesus goes into this teaching. And in Matthew 20, he starts by saying, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like, it's like a landowner who would be like a, a vineyard owner. He goes out early in the morning and maybe the grapes are in need of harvesting. It's harvest time, like it is in the tobacco patch in, in West Kentucky, and so many guys 
are looking at their tobacco fields and they're going, hey, it's time to cut. And these days, you've got to have a lot. I mean, you don't see small. Every farmer back in the day had a little patch, but today, you go big or you go home, right? When it comes to tobacco. And by the way, this is no, this is no endorsement for you to start using tobacco in your life, okay? Just, just want to throw that out. So the landowner goes out early in the morning. He owns a vineyard. The grapes are in need of harvest. And he's looking for people to work. There's actually 12 hours in the work day. And in the Jewish day, that 12-hour work day is broken up into three periods of time, or rather four periods of time. Like there's the, the early morning hour that they would call the first hour. And then there's like the third hour, which is like 9 a.m. And then you have the sixth hour, which is noon. And then you have the ninth hour, which is like 3 p.m. And then the twelfth hour is 6 p.m. at the end of the day. So he goes out early and looks for people to work in the field, to work the vineyard. The scripture says in verse 2, that he found some laborers that he hires... And when he had agreed with the laborers for denarius for the day, he sent them into the vineyard. A denarius or a denarii was the wage of a full day's work that a Roman soldier would receive. So for this kind of work, this is really good money for a day's work. One denarius, what a Roman soldier would receive for a full day's work. So those who are there early, he agrees with them, hires them. They're like, yes, we'll work for you. We'll give you a full day. You give us a full day's wage. Then the day goes on. The scripture says that he goes out. This is verse 3, about the third hour. Saw others standing out on the marketplace. Tells them to go into his vineyard. And he says this to them at this point. I'll give to you whatever is right. He does that at the third hour. Verse 5, he does it at the sixth hour. And then he does it again at the ninth hour. So now we are at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and he's still calling laborers and workers to go into the vineyard. At this point, he tells them, I'm going to give you your payday. is going to be whatever is right. Then the story gets really, really interesting. In verse 6, Jesus says that the landowner goes out at the 11th hour. So follow with me. If, the, if 6 p.m. is the 12th hour and they started at 6 a.m., 6 p.m. is the end of the day. Therefore, the 11th hour is approximately what time? The 11th hour is approximately what time? The 11th hour is about what? I mean, it's almost quitting time. And he tells them to go into work. And you can imagine, it probably takes a few minutes to get over to the vineyard. I don't know. Maybe they get there by 5.30. The most they work at all is an hour. And then the end of the day comes. In verse 8, Jesus said, And when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. So which is the last group? The last group to the first would be, he starts, he starts with those who come in at 5 o'clock, like 11th hour. They get paid first. Then those who came at the ninth hour, then those who came at the 6th hour, then those who came at the 3rd hour, then those, listen to this, those who came first 
are then paid what? Are you following the story? Those who came first are then what when it comes to getting paid? They are what? They are last. And don't you think it's interesting that the landowner might have done this on purpose so that those who came first would then become those who get paid last and all eyes are on the landowner as he gets out his checkbook and writes everybody a check. And here's what happens. When those, verse 9, when those hired about the 11th hour came, each one received a what? What did each one receive? A denarius. Pay for a full day's work. And guess who's watching? Those who came first. So in verse 11, Jesus, as he tells the story, when they received it, or rather back to verse 10, when those hired first came, they thought they would do what? They thought they would get more. So as they watched this unfold, those who came last are getting paid a full, day, full day's wage those who came first are watching, so when it's their place in line and he gets his checkbook out for them, they're expecting him to pay them more, even though earlier in the day they had agreed to a full day's pay and wage. And they expect more. But what does he pay them? He pays them exactly what he agreed to pay them which was a denarius. And so they start grumbling and complaining. And in verse 11, verse 12 rather, these last men have worked only one hour, they say, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to one of them, listen, friend, guys, listen, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Their only reply would be what? Yep, that's what we agreed. And then he says, take what is yours and go your way. But I wish to give to this last man the same. The same as to you. And then the landowner says, Is it not lawful or right for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am what? Or is your eye envious because I'm what? Or is your eye envious because I'm what? Is your eye envious because I, the landowner, I am what? I am generous. And then he says something that has been said so many times before. Have you ever been waiting in line somewhere, maybe at the movie theater or maybe at the buffet line? And you come up last at the buffet line and the person who's already at the end of the buffet line says to you as you to the buffet line, they look at you, they say, hey, why don't you go and feed me? And then maybe in a, a great sense of humility, you reply back to them, and you say, oh, no, 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 that's okay, that's okay. I'll stay last because the first shall be last, and the last what? And the last will be first. And so many times people have said that, they quoted that because Jesus says it here. And the idea so many times when people say that, oh, no, 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 you go in front of me, I'll take last. It's the idea that the first shall be last and the last shall be first as if the last 
is the better place to be in. Oh, I will humbly, I will humbly go last. And the thinking is that one day, someday, payday, when this thing comes around, because I was willing to go last today, I will really be there first in heaven or whatever. There's three perspectives in this story. There's the perspective of those who came the earliest. There's the perspective of those who came the last, or let's say it this way, the perspective of those who came first. There's the perspective of those who came last. And then you have the perspective of the landowner. Those who came first, they got a generous offer from the landowner. He said, I'll give you a full day's wage of what a Roman soldier would get. This is really more than enough and even more than what they would expect as laborers in a vineyard. Those who came last, their perspective, what do you think their reply was? What do you think their attitude was to the landowner when they line up and they get paid and they get paid a full day's wage knowing that they had only labored for one hour. What do you think they're thinking? A very, probably a very different attitude, a very different response from those who came first, right? And, and, and they probably went away and they're like, oh my goodness, isn't that landowner so gracious and kind and good? You would imagine that their only response would have been thankfulness Whereas the response of those who came first when they saw what happened, they were grumbling and they were complaining and they had thought that this was not what? They had thought this was not fair. Now, my goodness, I can remember when my kids were young. It's like they had this little fairness barometer built inside of them. Do your kids have a fairness barometer built inside of them that they are constantly evaluating and constantly looking at things upon life? And, and even when in comparing themselves to their siblings, have your kids ever said to you, well, that's not what? That's not fair. And what's interesting about this is because this is a teaching about the kingdom of God. One of the things that we do begin to see at least in regards to how this world operates, that so many times the ways of God are absolutely backwards to the ways of this world. Because there would be some people who would step out and say, that's not fair. This is a picture also of the grace of God and the generosity of God. And the reality is that God's grace is not fair. Because what if you got what you really deserved? What would you get? What would you receive? The grace and the generosity of God comes into your life. He extends an invitation for you to come to Him. The invitation doesn't even have to be sent. But he sends it through Christ. What if you got what you deserved? What if you got what was really fair in regards to a spiritual condition before God? What would you receive? Then the landowner, his perspective is, hey, I can do with my riches and my goodness what I desire. And the reality is generous to all. Watch this in the text because there's many times that what's really said in the text is not what you think is being said in the text because there's not, there's not a premium that's placed on being last. The issue that's at hand with those who came first is said in their reply to the landowner in verse 12. When they say, these last men have worked only one hour, they don't say, you've made them more than us, and they don't say, you've made them less than us. They say, you have made them what? You've made them equal. 
And that is the point and the teaching of Jesus in this parable in regard to what we all get and who we all are and what all we will receive in Christ. That those who came last and had only labored one hour, they get just as much as those who came early got. And those who came early, they get just as much as those who came late, which means they all get the same. They all get the same. And the point Jesus is making is this. It doesn't matter when you come. Because when you come, you get it all. Looking at the teaching of Scripture in regards to the afterlife or even now. Notice how many times the Scripture speaks of our reward, not our rewards. Because the reward for all of us is the same in Christ. There is no getting more and there is no getting less. And you need to know and you need to understand that as you serve God today in your life, you cannot get any more than what Christ has already given to you through His cross and resurrection. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. If you come when you're five years old or you're like the thief on the cross and you're hanging in your last moment and you've got one breath left in your lungs, if you call upon the grace of God in that moment, He will give you all. He gives you all. Here's something you must factor in to this teaching about the kingdom of heaven. Why was it in the story that the denarius, whether given to those who came first or those who came late, why is it in the story that all should have been satisfied with the denarius? And the reason for that is because the denarius was more than enough. What you receive in Christ. What you get through the riches of God. Is more than enough. And it doesn't matter. When you come. The important thing. Is that you come. And when you do. He gives to you. The fullness of His grace. And what we have to look forward to is not that I would get more than you or you would get more than me or you would get less than me or I whatever. It's that in Christ there is no partiality with God. He does not favor one over the other. He doesn't keep score or tabs in our lives. Why? Because when you come to faith in Christ, you receive all of His goodness and His grace. And it's more than enough. We believe that so much of the ideology that has crept into our church lives today in regards to mansions and crowns are really westernized ideas of prosperity, of getting more, and receiving more, and accumulating wealth than what the Bible ever begins to teach.
So Lord, we thank you that today in Christ, we all get the same. And the same that we all receive is more than enough. And it's equal to those who came early or they, those who came late. The issue was that he made them equal. Not one more, not one less, not the other less, not the other more. I really believe that when you and I begin to reflect the heart of God, We will praise Him. We will thank Him. When people come to Him, no matter when they come, that we're going to rejoice. There's no game. God's not partial. He's not playing favorites. He doesn't have a scorecard over here on the side and you're accumulating all this stuff. And then the person who comes light only has a little old shack in the corner somewhere in the shadow of your mansion. It's not biblical and it's not the heart of God. So brother, what are we going to get? It's about what you've already got. Paul teaches that you and I in Christ have received every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenly places. Which means the riches that you have in Christ today will not be added to. They will not be diminished or taken away from. You are not working or serving today that you might get more. You serve to love because you've received the fullness of heaven in your life. Sir, because you've received, not in order to get more. And when we reflect the heart of God, when we see people come into faith in Christ, we rejoice no matter when they come. Because in the moment that they come, they get all of what we have in Christ too. I'm going to invite you to stand with us this morning. And